afternoon, uh, everyone. Thank you very much for coming on this session, How Do You Solve a Problem Like Korea? Um, and actually, if you think about it, 2018 has been quite a roller coaster of a year. Just February was when Donald Trump was actually threatening to uh, drop a nuclear missile on North Korea. And six months later, denuclearization was apparently uh, carried through. And if, we're, if we believe what we read, uh, only uh, a couple of days ago, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Kim Jong-un and Donald Trump were almost going to receive a Nobel Peace Prize. So, you know, from the sublime to the ridiculous or vice versa, depending on your point of view, the question is, is you know, is Donald Trump a genius with a very, very large brain for resolving global conflict, something that hasn't been resolved for a long time? Uh, are there other forces pushing this uh, conversation, the geopolitics uh, that we can talk about? Is North Korea a power broker or a pawn in this conversation? So. There are, I'm sure, experts in the audience, and I'm sure there's people who just want to find stuff out. So it's got, a, it's got something for everyone, hopefully, this, this conversation. Women hold up all the sky on, a, on our panel. This is a gender balance gone crazy, and that's what um, North Korea can do for you. Uh, so it's a fantastic panel, and I'll just introduce them for you, in, in, not in the order we'll speak, because we're just going to have a conversation and bring you in uh, towards uh, the tail end of each particular section. First of all, we have Dr. Catherine Jones, lecturer at University of St. Andrews. She's the author of China's Challenge to Liberal Norms, and her recent research, funded by the Korea Foundation, explores China's relationship with North Korea. Next, uh, in the middle there, we have uh, Jian Beck. Am I right? Jian Beck. Yep. Jian Beck, sorry. <laughs> is author of North Korea's Hidden Revolution, how, to, how the Information Underground is Transforming a Closed Society. Previously, she was research fellow at Harvard University and worked at the Google headquarters for several years and is currently a doctoral candidate in public policy at the University of Oxford. And then finally, at the very end, we have Mary Jajewski, who has been a foreign correspondent in Moscow, Paris, and Washington, and a special correspondent in China, a writer and broadcaster who predominantly at the moment writes for The Independent and The Guardian, yes? Uh, good, My, I'm Austin Williams. I, I kind of know a little bit about China, and Korea has always been a fascination for me, so I'm going to learn something as we go along. As I say, we're going to do this conversation in two chunks, hopefully. Uh, we'll see how it goes. First of all, it's like on a historical context. Um, and I think, and anybody who watched the Michael Palin documentary, he kind of sim similarly said it himself. The general perception is that, you know, there's... 1948 independence, two years later, North Korea invades South Korea, right? Uh, and that's the way that we, we see it. But does anybody want to just pick up, maybe Jayan wants to pick up on why it was divided in the first place, because that might give us some context about even that, that uh, war that was launched back in the 50s. Do you want to give us some background history? Sure, um, Korean history in a minute. So um, the two Koreas shares a very, very long history, um, warring kingdoms, and you know, shared culture, shared language, and all of this. They're under Japanese colonial, um, they're colonized by the Japanese in early 1900s, and uh, gain independence um, at the end of World War II, the, the two Koreas. So Soviets want control over the North, or basically the, there's negotiations between um, a lot of the uh, major powers and the countries, the whole peninsula is divided by two. Um, so uh, communist um, influenced north and US and UN backed south. Um, 30th parallel is what divides the Koreas. It's pretty a very arbitrary division. And um, so a very, uh, sh a country of a very long shared history is divided into two. And um, then the Korean War breaks out, the North invades the South. And three years later, and after millions of deaths, nothing really changed. The two Koreas are currently still at war, um, technically, as most people will um, know. And that's where we are today. There's obviously a lot more to cover, but that's sort of how the countries have been divided. And so there is a shared language and a culture. Um, obviously, they've diverged tremendously uh, since, 19, you know, since the 1950s, but that's where we are today. Yeah, so, I mean, the other speakers can fill in. Like I say, it's a conversation, but does that mean it was a legitimate invasion by North Korea into South Korea? It Again, you don't necessarily have to answer this. This isn't just on you. Sure, sure. Diane. And yeah, I will, I'll uh, start off by saying it depends on whose perspective you are. Um, taking to answer that question. The North will obviously say it was a legitimate invasion to try to reunify the peninsula by force. Um, the country is being divided by outside powers um, very unfairly. Um, the US and, and others will say absolutely not. It was not a legitimate invasion. 
Um, South Koreans, I mean, I don't want to, it's not a monolithic population, especially over history, but they will generally say it was not a legitimate invasion either. So it just really depends on who you say. By the way, just North Korean history does um, say that it was not the North that invaded, but the U.S. back South that invaded. So the Korea's, um, the Korean history of the war um, is, is taught and uh, be, uh, believed in a very different way between the two Koreas. Okay, Catherine. But, um, feeding into that, the national narratives behind who invaded who, speaking to North Korean defectors, one of the things that they've said that they find really difficult to overcome is this ingrained knowledge that it was the North that invaded. They've been taught all of their lives that they were invaded by the imperialistic United States. And even when they've been living in South Korea or the West for a very long time, they say this is one of the things that they find extremely difficult to overcome. So when you sort of consider what are barriers to unification, this division between the narratives of history and the way it's taught, even though you could turn around and say, well, there are objective facts here and we can go back through the history, it's one of the key barriers that needs to be overcome. But in addition, at the time of the war, at the end of the Japanese occupation, North Korea was in a stronger economic position than South Korea. When the Japanese um, colonized the Korean Peninsula, they invested most of their infrastructure development um, in the north. Lots of train lines that are still sort of operating today are legacies of Japanese colonialism. So the sort of perception that South Korea is more advanced is only a perception since the 1970s, up to then. North Korea actually was the economic powerhouse of the peninsula. So there's, there's a sort of change around in fortunes, but there's also been these conflicting historical narratives, both of which present problems and challenges for moving towards resolving a problem like Korea. All right, Mary? Yes, could I just ask in the audience, who's been to Korea, either side of the demilitarized zone? Right, because I think it might be worth just saying a, a few words about how it looks to a complete outsider. Because if you go to South Korea, it is this. Abs it appears now to be this absolutely fantastically organised country that works. That, that every, everything works. Um, it's one of the most user-friendly airports that I've ever been through. Um, transport is user-friendly. You can even start to learn Korean on late-night television, where they have <laughs> Korean for beginners. Um, there's, it's sort of second only to Japan in that you feel that you're not really abroad because you're in a first world country, but then there's this whole sort of layer of being alien. And then you go and they, you can go in a tour bus to the demilitarized zone. And when you go to the, to the D, DMZ, it's a very, very peculiar feeling because certainly for me, the sense was not of nothing like, um, say, Checkpoint Charlie or the Berlin Wall during at the height of the Cold War. There seemed to be nothing like that sense of absolutely hair trigger risk. Um, it was it was sort of calm and a bit sort of park like, um, and they have this. Um, it, Inside the buildings, um, it's it's like frozen in um, a time a time of the sort of early 1950s, even sort of Second World War time. Very formal, very empty, and quite sort of uh, just a, a bit sort of ancient and old-fashioned. But one of the things that makes you think is that when you go in, you have to see every everybody who goes to visit the DMZ is given a piece of paper where they have to basically sign their life away and say that if anything, happ if anything happens, um, then they don't hold any responsibility, they don't hold the authorities responsible. And you sign this, and then when you come out, you're given it back as your souvenir <laughs> of um, what a sort of dangerous place you've, you, you've been to. Now, having said all that, um, when you're, th when you're about five weeks after I was there, and this is sort of five, six years ago, there was actually an incident um, with a North Korean soldier trying to cross the line, um, and he was shot. Um, so the, the, the sort of impression of it being peaceful and calm is slightly deceptive. The other thing is that, and I've not been into North Korea proper, 
that when you look at one of the things that they point out to you as you approach the um, demilitarized zone is that you see the bare hills in the distance. And the line from South Korea is that the hills are bare because during famine in the north, people were cutting down trees and they were eating, they, they were eating tree bark and, tr and, and, and tree roots, and that's all they had to, to, to live on. So you've got this sort of visual impression um, of the, the very stark difference that there is now between the north and the south. I mean, I would say it's probably one of the, one of the sharpest contrasts that there may be almost anywhere in the world between um, two countries which share a border. Okay, look, uh, I, I'm glad you introduced that because I think it's worthwhile maybe somebody picking up on as well the idea that the perception that, we, that many people have of China, you know, reminds us of Antonioni's film in the 1970s, you know, of, of uh, people scrabbling around agriculturally, whereas in fact China is a very modern society. Same question of, of North Korea. People's perception of North Korea is famine, 1990s famine. So that's 20 years ago, 25 years ago. So you know, has thing, have things changed? How have they changed in terms of development? And the second question, I suppose, is coming from your book, uh, Jian, is the, um, my reading of your book, I, I got a sense that there was a much more porous border, uh, that the idea of you know, running across the border being shot lit at night is Between more Between North that. Korea and China. Sorry? Uh, North Korea, Korea, China Korea yeah, North Korea. North Korea and China. And that idea that you know, you'd be shot, there was much more of this kind of, if you do a bribe, if you've got enough goods to come in, trade was being done, uh, social media connections with the outside world is much more prevalent. So you know, how, how have things actually changed on the ground in terms of North Korea <clears throat> and its relationship to China and also to the West? Uh, sure, I'll, I'll kick off and um, toss it to Dr. Jones after. So, um, so my book is about mainly about how foreign information has been uh, smuggled and otherwise uh, illicitly being pushed into North Korea through a variety of means over the past two, three decades, and some of the small social changes that has that the consumption of foreign information ha uh, by North Korean citizens has been sparking inside North Korea. Um, so I give some context, and uh, in terms of the porous border, so prior to the famine, so just for those who may not know, North Korea was hit by a very, very uh, devastating famine in the 1990s, and it estimated 800,000 to about 2.5 million people, so roughly 10% of the population um, died due to starvation and the effects of starvation. So there was just a lot of chaos that um, took place during that decade, and um, that's also when the first leader, Kim Il-sung, died, and so there was just a lot of um, changes in the country taking place. So prior to then, the, uh, the border between North Korea and China, um, it was never officially, not, not never, but it wasn't uh, officially a free border by any means, but there was less um, stringent security at the border. They share about like a 1,500 kilometer border, more or less. And so a lot of, some people were starving, they would go into China with the intent to buy some food, make some money, come back to North Korea to support their family members. Some of them, um, this is also the period when we saw the first major spike of North Koreans um, attempting to escape China uh, for mainly, uh, you, mainly economic reasons, but some political as well. Um, the border has been in, like, significantly tightened since then, so right now it's effectively not a porous border at all. There's a lot of um, legal and illegal trade taking place across the border, uh, but this is just people um, not doing this really with the government's explicit permission. So, so yeah, so right now it's just effectively totally clamped down. In terms of people defecting by, um, by bribing border guards, so defection from North Korea is punishable by death. Not only are the person who is caught, if they are caught, but um, punishing, uh, but also uh, it comes at the huge risk of one's family. This has been, um, this punishment of association, this uh, punishing three generations of one's family um, is not always carried out for defections, but has often been the case um, for, the, for, for many decades. And so defection really does come at very, very serious risk. So uh, border guards are often bribed. Um, under Since Kim Jong-un, the current leader, came into power in late 2011, um, South Korea, so the number one um, 
country of resettlement for North Korean defectors. They have seen a sharp decline of defectors coming into South Korea. There's many reasons that could be the case, um, but one major reason that is being uh, attributed to this decrease of defectors coming into South Korea is this extreme, this like, very extreme reinforcement of punishment of defectors or attempted um, to, uh, people who attempt to defect and their families inside North Korea. Um, just to clarify something about social media, so there is no social media as we know it, Facebook, Twitter, um, uh, WeChat, or whatever else, inside North Korea that's connecting people outside. There's a lot, so a lot of North Korean defectors, not all, um, but many, um, engage in social media, of course, amongst themselves and their friends outside of North Korea, but there's no technical um, social media that connects North Korean citizens with people outside. The major way people able, are able to connect, um, are able to communicate between North Korea and defectors and other people are through cell phones. Also highly punishable, um, and we can get more into that as well. So I just wanted to clarify that. A lot of the information stuff that I work on and talk about is about foreign information being pushed into North Korea through radio waves, um, uh, storage devices, you know, USBs oftentimes, and so on. Okay, and good. So I'll let someone else talk about how North Korea has changed over the years. Well, I'll come back on that. Uh, Catherine, do you want to give it a bash? So there's a few different things that come out of that. The, the issue of the border with China has been the focus of lots of debates around particularly whether China has broken sanctions in some of the goods that have crossed this border. And, and it has been tightened up. That, that border and the trade across it has been tightened up. And... There are risks for the Chinese as well in doing business with North Korea. It's sort of presented as being Chinese businesses doing illicit trade with North Korea under the quasi sanction of the Chinese government. But I think that's a misrepresentation of how trade is carried out on, those, on that border and how much risk there is for the Chinese businesses involved. Um, that being said, I th I th at least a few years ago, it was about 90% of North Korea's documented trade was with China and with Chinese companies. So in terms of money going into the states, supporting and changing the lifestyle of people within the state, China is a big partner and a big player. But that's not without its risks. And one of the other risks in considering the role that China could play in the geopolitics around this is that there are differences between Beijing, that is the, the People's Republic's approach, and the risks and instabilities in the three provinces that are most um, accessible to North Korea, the two that border and, and one that's slightly separated. And their trade is mostly with North Korea. And that's not just a risk for how much it could stabilize or be sanctioned but those border provinces are not the most developed parts of China either. So there is fragility on the Chinese side as well as on the North Korean side of that trading relationship. And we saw that when the increased sanctions were put in place in the last um, 12 months, that those provinces actually experienced some significant hardship because Beijing really cracked down on flows going across that border. But it's important not to forget that South Korea also has a part to play in trying to promote trade with North Korea and habilitate North Korea into the international economic architecture. The Kaesong Industrial Estate, Industrial Park, is South Korea's project for trying to engage North Korea economically. That opens and closes depending on other actions that are taking place. So it closed down <coughs> when we had nuclear tests from North Korea and missile tests. <coughs> But the money and the payments for people working within that um, complex in South Korea goes to the government and then gets paid to the workers. Obviously, they don't get paid as much as they would if they were being paid directly. There's a certain amount that goes straight to the Korean, North Korean government. But they are getting better pay than they would be in any other place that they could be working within North Korea. And so even though there is a payoff to say, well, some of this money is going to support the regime in North Korea, another part of that is how much do you want to try and improve the individual people's lives living within North Korea? 
And the final point um, I'd make on this is the, that since Kim Jong-un um, came to power in North Korea, there has been a certain expansion of the black market within the North. And that's quasi-illicit trade that's happening under some sanction of the North Korean regime. And that has expanded and helped to boost people's um, living standards, not by a great deal potentially, but it is making a difference. And lots of that trade is coming in through that border with China in the north. And that's a huge factor. One of the questions I asked the last time I was in South Korea was, have you got an estimate on how big that black market is? The answer was no. Now, I don't believe the South Koreans don't have an estimate. I believe that they probably don't want to say how much, because it could just be a guess. OK, thank you. Mary. Um, yes, I'd just like to add a couple of things about North Korea's economy, which I heard recently, which, as it were, surprised me. Um, one of them is that um, although it's obviously a highly centralized country, there is a, a huge disparity in living standards and availability of consumer goods between Pyongyang and practically everywhere else. Um, and there is um, a de facto policy of, as it were, keeping the Pyongyang elite on board. Um, and the rest of the country is maybe not quite as deprived as it was, say, 10, 15 years ago, um, but the disparity is huge. Um, the second thing is about the, um, the black market or the um, de very primitive development of small business, um, which um, has been described as the kioskization um, with people setting up, you know, temporary little shacks and kiosks um, to sell goods essentially on the streets. And why I think this is so interesting is because this, in fact, is how the liberalization of the then Soviet economy began. Um, and over the year, over the last sort of 20 years, I've watched going to Russia as how, the, first of all, there were the kiosks in a completely wild state, and then the kiosks were more sort of formalized and they were um, more, more developed and more permanent. And then, lo and behold, over the last sort of five, ten years or so, um, most of the kiosks have vanished. Um, they've been taken off the streets, and they've, the, the people who had them have gone, as it were, into completely legitimate, m much more permanent businesses. So I think that's the sort of beginning. Um, it can be the beginning of quite a serious trend. Um, the other thing I thought it might be worth doing was just looking at the, um, as it were, the other neighbors. Um, if we look at um, United States, you know, what are, what, what are its priorities, what are its hang-ups? Can we... Do you want to Can we do, do the geopolitics bit in a moment? Okay, in a right. moment. In I'll a shut moment. up on that. <laughs> no, 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 no it's, it's good to warm us up. Um, because I think there's also this idea of the Yanbian area in the, in the north of North Korea on the Chinese side, which is that Koreans are an official ethnic minority group within China from, uh, from Mao's day. Uh, and the trade that goes across the mountain regions there is also kind of black market and unknown, but it's, it genuinely happens. Um, and I think that there's this also the idea about um, the way that the diaspora uh, away from Korea sees North Korea's relationship and that, you know, the hostility that is uh, generated once they arrive in South Korea towards North Korea. So that's, th there's a general framework. So that's the kind of internal Korean conversation we've just had some explanation about. Can I take, we've got a short amount of time for some punchy, punchy questions and some even punchier re responses. If anybody has any comments on what we said so far. Do you think um, Kim Jong-un is actually um, an absolute leader with total control, or is he just a puppet of a, a military elite? If uh, North Korea received reliable information about what's going on in world affairs and so-called West and so forth, what would be the two things that shocked them most? To what extent do you think that North Korea now mirrors Mao's China, because they both have they both had um, a similar case of famine. They both had the um, like extreme communism and dictatorial rule. So to what extent can that parallel be drawn? Will North Korea survive? What are the pressures for fragmentation or stability? I noticed that uh, some of the comments were about increasing living standards for North Koreans. Um, so what balance would you put on that? Um, how likely is there to be fundamental change. With the first question about um, Kim Jong-un, how, how far he's, um, he, he has freedom of manoeuvre and how far he's a prisoner of the military elite. My view is that um, when he first came to office, he was really quite constrained and he was looking over his shoulder a lot of the time um, and he had to be very careful. And then there were various things that happened, including, I think, the execution of his uncle.
and um, various pieces of rather unsavoury evidence that he was trying to consolidate his power. I think he has much more freedom of manoeuvre now, um, but again, what I'm told is that he has to, he has to watch quite carefully to keep the, the Pyongyang elite on his side or to make sure that they, they don't get organised enough to bid against him. And I think it's very, very important. Um, when we read and see the things that Kim Jong-un says, to see those in the light of him having a domestic audience. Um, because there's a general assumption, I see it so often with Russia, but also with China, that people say, oh, well, you know, they're, they're, they're in com the leaders are in complete control, that they don't have a public opinion. Well, they may not have a public opinion as such, but they have interest groups that they have to be quite wary of. Um, so I think in all Kim's um, statements, that aspect has to be has to be considered quite carefully. Thank you. I think one of the major differences between North Korea and China, there's a lot of similarities and many more differences, but the one major one is that North Korean's version of communism has um, many aspects of Chuche ideology, um, the idea, this ideology of self-reliance on ourselves only, North Koreans only, and that has, that has um, basically made become a formula for its own type of a religion. So Kim Il-sung is not a leader or a um, father figure um, like Mao and Deng Xiaoping, or he is God. Like he is, like, I mean, this is Kim Il-sungism, he is God. And um, he comes from the divine family line from you know, Mount Pekdu. And, and, his, um, and Kim Jong-il, Kim Jong-un, and their um, successors are, um, successors and predecessors, they are divine. And so I think that leads to um, this idea of uh, what will be, oh, this kind of my response to this, the question, what will be maybe some of the very shocking pieces of information of the foreign information going in. I've spoken with a lot of North Koreans who've, um, who've escaped um, over, yeah, many. And when I asked them this question, what shocked you the most when you were in North Korea? It was usually, it was almost always two things. One was, um, alternative information and history about North Korea's country's history. So the fact that, um, that it wasn't the South that invaded the North and sparking uh, the division of uh, this, you know, this holy peninsula, but it was actually the other way around. And the other piece, uh, other category of information that was very shocking was the truth about the Kim family, that these were not um, very Confucian conservative families with one wife and, um, you know, the nuclear family that all Asian, you know, good Confucian Asian families are supposed to have. But there were many concubines and lovers and, um, and I mean, a whole cadre of like the royal concubine forces and um, how, they, how the leaders and the, the family members of the, this divine um, uh, lineage engaged in all sorts of activities and behaviors that were not reflected in um, the, the textbooks and uh, North Korean's history. Um, version of history. And, and so, and the last response I'll give is about North Korea's survival prospects. I think it, I think it's very high. I think Kim Jong-un, now that he has a lot more room for maneuvering and has established himself as a very brutal uh, person, a uh, brutal, not person, a leader, is that he will, I think he will continue to engage in not liberalization, but this kind of, um, under the guise of incremental liberalization, that he is uh, like this cheery leader, um, he's not going to be as br brittle as the former leaders were. Um, he, you know, he's shown in state media wearing like, like white t-shirts um, and kind of hugging children and laughing and smoking with his uh, colleagues, images that were never ever possible to be viewed on North Korean media. But this is some of the official images that he's showing. Um, and that's just one tactic that I think he's engaging to try to recreate his image internationally and also for his domestic audience um, and engaging all sorts of other policies to try to um, ensure the survival of his regime. As, and um, I think Kim Jong-un's intelligence is absolutely not to be underestimated. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> yeah. So I'll just link to a couple of the survival of North Korea. Um, I also think it's likely to survive. I think it's likely to survive partly from two things, one of which goes back to Mary's point about the importance of the black market. At the moment, 
I think the black market is helping to stabilise internally within North Korea because people are being able to get access to things. And I think that means that the internal collapse narrative is less likely because of that. At the same point, if the black market becomes much bigger, I think that becomes a source of information from the outside world, and I think that becomes a threat to the regime. So there is a sort of fine balance and a tipping point to be played out with that. And I think there's also something to reflect on, and this is going to link to our, our next chunk of discussion, which is how much do the wider players want North Korea to survive? They may not want it to survive in its current formulation, but they certainly don't want to see a collapse on the Korean Peninsula. It would be um, problematic for the global economy, it would be problematic for South <coughs> Korea, it would be problematic for Japan, and certainly for China. Well, let me, can, I, can I jump in on that question yeah. then, since you've now taken over chairing this? Uh, <laughs> no, it's because I think it's important that, do they want to see North Korea collapse? As you say, no, it would be problematic. Do they want to see reunification is a different question. Uh, Maybe the same answer. But how do you see, and this is the question I'm going to throw out to you in terms of the geopolitical relationship here, uh, two things. One is that, uh, you know, the, I suppose 25 million people entering into a country of 35 million people will be make German reunification look like a tea party. Uh, so there's definitely going to be problems. But is anybody wanting that? Uh, and the second question, I suppose, is since there's been this well, for me, a revelation that, you know, in Japan there are North Korean schools funded by North Korea uh, to teach North Korean um, uh, diaspora. Um, and there's this kind of Singaporean relationship from the summit, but also Singapore has had long-term relationships with North Korea in terms of visa-free travel. That there is a slightly opening up here. Is it all about China and America, or is there other players willing and able to get in on this act? Two wide-ranging questions, so feel free to, don't ignore them, but feel free to pick on the parts that you most... I'll cede to the others on those, those two particular ones, except one, one slight comment, um, which is, I think, with, um, with, with the two Germanies, there was, um, a very, there, there was knowledge on both sides, and there was um, quite a will on both sides towards unification. And I'm not sure the same thing exists between the two Koreas. And in particular, I'm not sure that, first of all, that the, the North maybe has less first-hand knowledge of how it really is in the South. Um, but also, there is a sort of general assumption that um, the better-off side, if you like, um, would actually um, uh, seize unification as a goal of un uniting the country. And at least at a popular level, I'm not sure that's true. And I just draw one mini parallel, which is that um, quite recently there were archives that came out that said that um, Margaret Thatcher had asked her civil servants about the possibility of changing the border between Northern Ireland and the Irish Republic um, and said, well, maybe we got it wrong when the border was first demarcated. The idea was that Derry, Londonderry might be the wrong side of the border. And this was broached unofficially and it wasn't the North that vetoed it, it was the South. And I think that always has to be borne in mind that if you're going to have reunification, it's got to be on both sides. I think on unification's point, I think we have to start with the question, what would, whose terms are we talking about? There's two major categories, or two major definitions or kind of visions of unification, and then there's various uh, permutations of each one. One is basically the South's version of unification, which is basically unifying the whole peninsula and all of the glorious Korean people under South Korean democratic capitalistic rule um, and continuing its strong alliance with the US and so forth. That is not North Korean's version of unification, which is to unify um, uh, the Korean people under Pyongyang's rule. And uh, both countries' constitutions, since the state's um, separate inceptions of each country, um, ha they have in their own constitution that and the whole peninsula is their own. So constitutionally, both countries recognize, they do not recognize the other side. Um, so, so I've seen a lot of surveys um, from South Korean, like various think tanks, and that um, there's like, it's kind of by generation and um, gender and socioeconomic class and so on and so forth. But the major takeaway is um, to the question, do you want unification as a Korean person? 
South Korean person with the North? And it's like an overwhelming yes, like 80 something percent yes. And then the next question is, um, do you want unification tomorrow? No, because <laughs> it's you know because of the, the technicalities of unification, the costs of it. First of all, who's going to pay for it? Prop the assumption is South Korea, but South Korea doesn't want to pay the trillions. And tr I mean, I've seen a lot of estimates for what unification would look like, and all the estimates are just basically trillions on trillions on trillions. Um, integrating people who have who really cannot be more different uh, in, in terms of their views on each other, their history and so forth. So this idea is unification seems like a really beautiful dream to, uh, to pursue, but it's probably not likely, and especially from a geopolitical perspective. I think most people want to manage North Korea and not want a unified peninsula. Um, that's what, yeah, that's what I'll, yeah. Yep. That, that's for now. So linking to that, Plans for reunification. South Korea does have a Ministry of, of Unification, and it comes up with plans and updates them on what unification would look like. These are not unproblematic plans. Yes, they are produced, but they are costed, and the costs are overwhelming. But similarly, at the moment, South Korea's plan is, is in part linked to its process for habilitating defectors from the north. So at the moment, there are three reception centers that South Korean has that um, tries to teach North Korean um, former residents about life in South Korea, gives them some skills for um, getting blue collar jobs, getting um, things like their dental work up together, a health plan, education. These centers, you. you Defectors or, or former residents go to these centers for about six months. It's completely insufficient in terms of introducing them to South Korean society. Added to which the, the nature of the defectors tend to be more highly educated North Koreans. And this comes back to one of your, your points from the first part, which is we sort of view North Koreans as being not well educated. But that's also slightly a, a misrepresentation. Some of them can be highly educated and have engaged... Fully literate society. Yeah, and have engaged widely with um, um, other cultures and other societies. So I think we've got a misperception of exactly the, the types of people that would be engaged with on the South Korean side. Um, relating to that, in terms of who would pay for this, um, Japan hasn't really been mentioned in this conversation yet, but it's a hugely important player. Not only have we got issues of comfort women and other legacies of the Second World War and colonization from Japan that's still being worked through with South Korea and Japan that faces, that presents major problems for these two supposedly related um, states that should be on the same page. Both of them are US allies. That, le that legacy and that history presents an enormous problem for those two on paper natural allies to work cooperatively. When you throw on top of that North Korea, the um, kidnapping of Japanese citizens and taking, and taking them to North Korea, Japan is going to be a major player. But Japan also has other issues to deal with that are still legacies from the Second World War that have in part been suspended in anim animation in its relationship with North Korea. So there are lots of players that could be putting money into this, into this um, project who may not want to pay that money in. And I think that relates to, I mean, you could, as an academic, you could pull apart all of the different who wants, to, who wants reunification from South Korea's general population and the government, provinces in China, the local population, and you would get a slightly different impression of who wants unification and the kind of unification they want. And the real problem is trying to pull together those into something that's actually workable. Yeah, but as an academic, you would say that, wouldn't you? Because yeah. <laughs> it's like it's policy rather than politics. Uh, and it's question as to, you know, a, a, a nation divided, there's something integral that has now been uh, destroyed. And North Korea, in many ways, has been a pawn from the use by the, uh, by the Cold War in terms of its evasion in the 1940s and 50s. So that whole thing was never necessarily a North Korean device. It was power play between major 
uh, imperialist powers uh, in a Cold War. You've had the famine, which was the end of communism, the fall of the Berlin Wall, and the, and the rejection and the, the, the retreat of the Soviet Union not to offer aid to North Korea, which led to all kinds of kind of financial and agricultural problems. And now you've got a situation which you just described as, you know, people don't want this to happen, right? America doesn't want, you know, the problems of reunification with the North, and China doesn't want this reunification for all kinds of external, extrinsic reasons. But where does kind of Korea fit in this conversation, this narrative? So I'm just more interested in, first of all, whether you think it would necessarily or possibly be a good idea that they reunify. Uh, and secondly, in terms of if North Korea is simply just a pawn, then which, which power play is offering the best options for people? You know, Donald Trump wants to build hotels on the beaches where the, where the missiles are being launched from, so he can see kind of capitalist potential there, but so can China. And is, is, what is North Korea going to be? You know, what, what's, the, what's the future for it? Um, well, I will jump in there and then hand yeah, it back to, to these two. I think, I think there's, there's a good division between short-term and long-term good ideas around North Korea. Um, I don't agree with its perception that it is a pawn. Um, it may have been back in the 1950s and the 1960s. I don't think it still is a pawn. One of the things that I hear from, from, from colleagues in China is North Korea is a bigger headache for the Chinese government than the South China Sea. And they just want the problem to go away. At the same time, they've, it serves certain purposes for China, but the question is, could those purposes, for example, not having the US troops on the Chinese border if unification happened, could those purposes be served equally well by having a restructured North Korea? Um, so I, I'm not sure I agree that North Korea is still a pawn um, of the major powers. Um, and there are plenty of economic opportunities in North Korea. I heard uh, a few years ago that there's a lot of mining potential in North Korea that is yet to be accessed <coughs> because they just don't have the technology to be able to get those, those resources. So I think in the long term, certainly one of the fears on the peninsula is if you had a reunited North and South Korea, it would be a major economic powerhouse, but it would probably take 50 years to get to that status and there would be a lot of short-term losses for South Korea in the process. But after that time period, you've got all of the industrial opportunities presented by adding an extra um, population to, to your, your banks. I think that creates another longer-term fear for some of these players. Deng Xiaoping was 50 years ago, wasn't he? Yeah, I, don't, I agree with uh, Dr. Jones. I don't think North Korea is a pawn. Uh, we haven't mentioned nuclear weapons today, which is kind of refreshing because every conversation about North Korea is about nuclear weapons. But um, with the development of it and pretty much, uh, you know, Kim Jong-un has announced to his central committee earlier in um, April, like, we're done. So there's this policy of um, Pyongjin, kind of parallel development between their nuclear weapons and their economic development, like guns and butter. And he said, we're done with the nuclear peace. Um, like, we're good. And so we can start are focusing on developing a lot of their domestic, um, uh, their economy. And so whether or not we're going to take his uh, words at face value, you know, that's, you know, it's up to you. But I mean, in terms of what they've been able to uh, reveal about their capabilities through their six nuclear tests and many, many more missile uh, launches, it's pretty clear that they, they have, like, they, they're, they're nuclear capable. And so I think that combination, the nuclear piece in addition to um, their very, very strict um, uh, social control over its population, and we can, you know, we can talk about human rights and the, the really, really egregious human rights violations and so forth. I think that combination, um, and there's of course many other factors as well, reveal that they are the Kim Jong Un and his. Uh, colleagues know what they are doing, and they are in full control of not only um, their domestic situation, but with their uh, with with the world's leaders, and um, they, I, I'm of the opinion that he is really orchestrating a lot of um, the sort of very kind of unexpected uh, string of diplomatic uh, events that we've seen over the past six months or so. Okay. It's actually, it's just, it's remarkable. I mean, North Korea's 25 million people, South Korea's 50 million people. So North Korea, the only reason, I mean, this is a really bad joke, but a lot of people in the North Korean community who's like, they're pretty you know, tired of um, their antics say, um, 
Okay, actually, well, it's actually not a really good joke, but basically, it's you know, it's 25 million people. One of the poorest countries in the world, their GDP per capita is estimated to be about $1,200, um, which is a little more than Burma's, uh, Myanmar's um, GDP per capita. And, um, and they're on the news every single day. If they didn't have nuclear weapons, um, I really doubt that that would be the case. There's many other countries that are small or you know, roughly around the same population um, that don't make the news. So I think so that's just kind of a little minor rant, but I think that he is in control. He is not, um, North Korea is not a pawn, and they will increasingly be very dangerous if, we, um, if, if events unfold the way that he wants it to. Thanks, Mary. Um, yeah, I mean, I agree with pretty much everything that's been said, that North Korea is not a pawn of anybody. Um, and also everything that's been said about Japan um, and the sort of historical legacy, um, which makes for gigantic difficulties with both North and South Korea. Um, and I think there's an additional dimension, which is that um, South Korea, because of its rapid development, has become a direct rival in trade um, and exports um, to Japan. Um, often exporting similar things much more cheaply. Um, so there's not a lot of reason, there's, there's quite a lot of reasons for no love lost, being lost between um, either Korea and Japan. Um, I'd, I just maybe I'm going to be guilty of going on to an, another topic, but I think if you look at two other players in this, um, and the nuclear question was mentioned, um, I think that for the United States, which obviously is a player in this, security was the, really the only consideration. Um, and that was what, what, what was at the heart of um, Trump's initiative and indeed Bill Clinton's diplomacy before. Um, the other is Russia, which almost never gets mentioned. Um, and the interesting thing about Russia is that it does have trade relations with both Koreas. It actually has much more flourishing relations with South Korea since the end of the Soviet Union. South Korea has been a big um, trade partner of Russia. Um, Russia also has a Korean minority um, resident in parts of Siberia and the north of Central Asia, but also obviously on the um, Pacific coast, but not in Vladivostok. There's, the, there's a sort of triangle that Vladivostok, the influence is Chinese, um, Sakhalin, the influence is Japanese, and the Koreans are mostly north of Vladivostok, and they're quite a compact community, but they have a degree of economic power um, because they're considered very good um, sort of market gardeners and small business people, and so they've got a degree of political clout that maybe is um, be beyond what you might expect. And when the <coughs> Trump diplomacy began, you could see that Russia was really, really worried about getting left out of this. Um, and I think that um, one of Kim Jong-un's next um, official visits is actually going to be to Moscow. I just wanted to ask the panel for their opinions on why Donald Trump gets so much credit for the cooling down of North and South Korean relations, <coughs> despite the fact that uh, the Sunshine Policy and other American diplomats and well, international diplomats have been working for so many years to cool down relations, but he gets so much credit. A question's for all the panel, and it, it follows on from um, the point about what's changed under the new leader. It's now over 10 years since um, the Israeli airstrike, which destroyed the nuclear site in Syria. Are there any indications since 2011 of changes to what I feel is a very under-researched uh, and un misunderstood aspect of North Korean activities, which is its commercial and uh, secretive activities, often involving its military industrial complex. Um, the, the obvious examples are Zimbabwe and more recently the East African coast. Um, I just wonder, do we know enough about all this as a way of understanding the country and maybe links with China or absence of links with China? And um, any signs that it's changed under the new leadership? Uh, always understanding that in addition to sinister reasons and politics and perhaps enrichment of the elite, there's also the simple facts of generating hard currency. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Thanks. Um, often when countries um, take part in ge ge uh, international relations, 
they uh, have, their audience is domestic. I wonder who Kim Jong-un's prime audience, is it for North Koreans or is it for the outside world? I've kind of got two points, slightly related. Um, we see a lot of North Korea in the media. And I'm interested in the panel's opinions on um, kind of in this era of fake news. How can we interpret what we see in the media about North Korea uh, in a more objective way? Because, for example, we saw this crazy story about um, Kim Jong-un had decided you can have one of three haircuts, which probably wasn't true. Um, so how can we go about you know, understanding what we see in the media about North Korea? Um, my second point is I'd like to hear the panel's opinions on tourism in North Korea. Um, mostly because I was in Pyongyang about three weeks ago. <laughs> so I'd be interested to know what your thoughts on kind of that are as well. Uh, this is about reunification and relations with the South. Obviously, it's been half a century since families were split up. A lot has changed in terms of generational perspectives. I know that uh, defectors, when they go to South Korea, uh, get an allowance, they get trained. You were talking about the financial implications. I wonder if now that we've got generations who no longer remember and have ties to the country as a whole, uh, some of the political sentiment around that might be shifting. Why does Donald Trump get the credit? Um, well, I'm going to give a very unpopular answer and I expect to be completely shouted down, which is that I think actually he deserves it. Um, and I'll say why, because yes, you're right about the Sunshine Policy and the Sunshine Policy was largely um, associated with Bill Clinton. But it didn't come to anything, both because of changes in America and because of changes in South Korea. And so it wasn't sustained. But also because I think even if it had gone further, the one thing that North Korea craved, I don't think that President Bill Clinton, even he, um, would have been prepared to give, which was to appear on the same stage as the North Korean leader with the appearance of equality. And that, I think, is what Trump appreciated. That, I mean, we, we saw some very clumsy diplomacy um, on the part of North Korea towards the Obama administration, with Dennis Rodman saying, just make that call, Obama, just make that call. But probably because of diplomatic niceties and hesitancy and general caution, Obama did not make that call. Donald Trump did make that call. And OK, it, potentially it was, it, it was a risk. But he made that call. And what, it seems to me, North Korea craved was you know, respect on the international stage. And that's something he needed internally to go to the other question. He also felt he needed it externally. And that's what Trump gave him. Now, you know, you can all complain and object that he didn't deserve that, that North Korea is not on a par with the US, et cetera, et cetera. But what it did was to bring North Korea and Kim Jong-un in from the cold. And I think the effect, OK, it may be a short-term effect, has not been limited to North Korea. It's been a diplomatic effect that has relaxed tensions right across that whole region. Um, and I think, that's, I think that's something that Trump does deserve the credit for. There you go. I'll, I'll, dev right, right? I'll so dovetail on, on this idea of respect and say uh, North Korea craves legitimacy. And so to the um, question about you know, who is Kim Jong-un's audience with these recent diplomatic um, efforts, I would say both you know, domestic and international, but primarily it's its domestic audience, I think. Um, he, as a young person, when he first came into power, people thought, this guy has no international, uh, no military training. I'm like, who is he to be our leader? But you know, he's, he's done all sorts of things to try to establish himself as a legitimate leader. But these past couple months really reinforces the, this idea that we as North Koreans have nothing to envy. This is um, what Do Barbara Demick often, um, that's, that's the title of her book actually, um, definitely worth reading. We have nothing to envy as North Koreans. Look at the world leaders lining up to talk to our leader, Kim Jong-un, um, when he says he wants to. And Trump, you know, the, the US leader tweeting about uh, our country and how honorable of a man Kim Jong-un is. I think Kim Jong-un's, um, his primary audience is domestic. Um, the, and the last thing I'll mention for now is this point about media. I love this question. I think when we see North Korea in the news, it's often 
crazy, you know, brainwashed people who, uh, you know, fall over themselves and they like convulse when you know the leaders around, or um, the leader like looking at funny things and like you know him being fat and like weird, um, and that's all fine. But I think this, but along these themes of sensationalization and the romanticization of North Korea's tragedy and trauma is not doing anyone favors. Um, North Korea, like any other society, is incredibly complex. Um, just like any, like just like in any other place really. And so I think to, to address that, um, we need to involve, we just need to invite so many more voices of North Korean defectors. Um, it's, they're definitely not a monolith. They have individual stories and to cover a really a different array of Good. people's experiences you can all read your book. to be continued after the talk. Thanks, Kath. Uh, all right, I'll be as fast as I possibly can. Um, commercial activities. There was a fantastic book written by Andrea Berger that I think is entitled North Korea's Nuclear Customers. Um, it's a fantastic book. It's probably the best thing that's written on how North Korea is engaging um, other regimes. Um, other forms of hard income, one of the things that it gets money from is actually foreign workers from the DPRK working abroad as construction workers, but also in IT. Um, we don't know enough about that particular aspect of North Korea's hard cu currency reserves. Um, media, there's been lots talked about in terms of representing North Korea in the media. Um, somebody like Roland Bleicher has written about this. Um, there's another person whose name I can't remember. I know that he's based in Germany. I think it could be Slim. Um, so there are lots of narratives about interpreting the images and other f narratives of information that we get from North Korea. I don't think Donald Trump deserves credit. I think that actually this is a cycle that we can see repeated over time where we have escalating tensions, de-escalating tensions, and it actually links back to um, a previous comment that lots of this is art. A, pan, a plan and a pattern that's emanating from North Korea, maybe opportunistically using the Trump administration, knowing that they're going to adopt a different kind of policy than Obama. But I still don't think Donald Trump deserves the credit. I think in the, broader, the broader history of it suggests that it's North Korea pulling some strings. Can we applaud the panel, please? <laughs>